Mm. Hi. Welcome back to the tragedy of Macbeth, week two. Before we start, I wanted to show you my own tragic king. Oh, this grumpy, sleepy guy is my puppy, and his name is King. Arr, he's so mad at me right now. Sorry to wake you up, buddy. I'm going to put you down. Oh, oh, come here. Can't have one without the other, right? Tia. Tia says hi. She's very Okay, anyway, sorry, that was enough of that. Um, unnecessary dog break. Let's dive back into the tragedy. Okay, so tragedy itself, right? Characteristics. First of all, um, at the time, it was considered, and I think you could even say today too, right? In, in our different genres of film, the serious films, um, the tear jerkers, the, uh, the really uh, graphic real films are considered higher art than our, than our comedies. Um, part of that is because of the idea of catharsis, uh, which is the purification and uh, purgation of, of emotions through art, uh, particularly pity and fear. Um, the idea that, that you watching somebody else suffer and, and empathizing with them makes you a better person uh, for having witnessed it and seen it and all that sort of thing. Um, in tragedies, timing is never in anybody's favor, um, and there's always violence and death. You can almost almost certainly um, count on on your hero, uh, your, let's not say hero, your protagonist um, meeting uh, his untimely end. So, not that you didn't already know this because you've read for this week and you know what happens to Macbeth, but now you certainly know what to expect every time. Okay, where are we left off? There's unrest in Scotland. Uh, Macbeth has been executing people who don't agree with him. He's obviously, you know, come unhinged since the banquet scene. Um, and, and Macduff has left uh, to get help in overthrowing uh, Macbeth. Um, he, Macbeth himself, um, decides to, to return to the witches. He, uh, he wants to, he wants new... Um, you know what? What they got in the past. What he got in the past isn't enough. Now he wants new um, premonitions, new predictions from them. He wants answers. Um, so, uh, if the first set of of you know th the three premonitions by the witches set the tone for the first half of the play, you know the second set um, sets the tone for Act Four and onward. Um, Macbeth uh, he comes to them. And he, and he conjures them, uh, which is which is so interesting, right? He uses their own um, methodology, their own their own words, their own system of magic uh, to 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 call on them, to order them to do something. I conjure you by that which you profess. You know, answer me, uh, and they reply, speak, demand, will answer, and then they show him three things. The armed head uh, appears and says, Macbeth, beware, Macduff. The thing to fight, uh, you know, the bloody child appears, and the uh, the apparition says, "Be bloody, be bold and resolute. No man of woman born shall harm Macbeth." And then the third apparition tells him, "Macbeth shall never be vanquished. Uh, uh, well, Macbeth never vanquished shall be. Whatever, I'm getting it wrong. Doesn't matter. Macbeth will not be beaten until great Burnham Woods shall come against him." Uh, so Macbeth, you know, starts feeling pretty good about himself. Why do I need to fear Macduff if I can't be beaten by anybody born of a woman? And if no one can beat me until I'm attacked by the woods, uh, themselves coming at my castle, uh, then psh, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be fine. Ah, oh, yes. But Macbeth, if two and three are true, one may be true too. And also, don't trust equivocators ever, ever, ever. So uh, now um, that you are listening uh, after reading this and you know uh, the ending, um, how how is it that uh, the, the witches trick Macbeth? You know, how are they um, equivocating even with their their uh, apparitions here? The armed head, the bloody child, 
um, and then a child crowned with a tree in his hand. Anyway, um, think about uh, all of the, this assurance, of course, is not enough for Macbeth, um, and he, he really came to know one thing. He has one question. Um, he wasn't even worried about this other crap until they brought it up. Uh, he wants to know, what's the deal with Banquo's heirs? Um, are they still going to be taking the throne? And the apparitions tell him not to seek any more knowledge uh, through them. And he threatens, he threatens to curse them. Um, we, we certainly, of course, have seen Macbeth come a long way. Uh, in his ability to conjure and to curse. Um, and he, he, you see here that he has become this unnatural thing. And in so, uh, you know, doing, he gets, he gets a response from them. Uh, he, he threatens these, these supernatural creatures and he gets, he gets an answer, you know. Um, they're willing to bow to him, but it's, it's also tricky, right? Because we know that they've, they've, they're just humoring him. They've got him in their thrall. So uh, he gets his final apparition, and eight kings appear with Banquo last. And Macbeth, Macbeth cries out in dismay because each king in the line has a resemblance to Banquo. Um, and the witches dance and vanish, and Macbeth calls for Lennox, uh, who comes to him to tell him that A, he didn't see no witches, and B, uh, also, by the way, Macduff has fled for England. So Macbeth does the logical, uh, I mean, at this point, how how, do, how does logic even work in this play? But the logical thing, and he decides to ride to Macduff's castle and slaughter his family, um, since no one's there to defend him, and that's just what he does these days, I guess. So, we get to see a rather, um, I think, endearing bit of interaction between Lady Macduff and her children. Um, just enough, you know, here to make them seem real and likable, at least, at least to me. And, uh, you know, she is she is a very witty son, uh, but it's but it's sad and and it's intimate and and as she ta she talks about her husband having left them as sitting ducks and we already know um, as all of this is happening that there are people coming uh, to 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 kill them we we've already we've already seen what what she suspects and then she gets practically no warning no no warning at all um, before murderers arrive. And, uh, and we get to see a little bit more proof of how far Macbeth has fallen when we have to, when we have to watch as uh, they kill the little boy and chase, and chase the mother off stage. Uh, so here Macbeth, or I'm sorry, Macduff finds, finds Malcolm and um, tries to convince him to come back to Scotland. Uh, with him to oppose Macbeth and to take over for, uh, you know, as king for his father, possibly, you know, as as uh, the original heir to the throne before he fled uh, after his father's death. And um, Malcolm believes, uh, says he believes Macduff to, or well, he believes Macduff to be an agent of Macbeth's, and so he tests him by describing himself as vile and and uh, not fit for being a king, and. Um, to, just to see to see what Macduff's response would be, and uh, and and in sorry, ooh, got distracted. Um, and uh, but Malcolm gets the honest response from Macduff that he wanted, so he reveals himself uh, to have been feigning. In fact, you know, he shares news that that England has already lent him troops, and uh, together they might stage uh, an, an attack that would that would topple Macbeth. So they've both been kind of planning the same thing, and now they've. They've come together and they're going to do it together. Um, but then Ross arrives uh, to tell Macduff what we have already seen, that uh, his entire household has been slaughtered. There's this great line here where Macduff learns this, um, um, and, and he hears that Macbeth has killed his children, and Ross says, Be comforted. Let us make medicines of our great revenge to curse this deadly grief. And Macduff continues his own rant and says, he has no children, all my pretty ones, uh, which is so tragic. And either he's saying, Ross, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about trying to comfort me at this time. You don't have kids. How could you even know what this is like? Or he's saying, you know, talking to Macbeth, he has no children. You know, that maybe that explains uh, his cruelty towards towards mine. Um, this, you know, how could, how could somebody who had kids do such a, a terrible thing to somebody else's? Um, so, of course, there are two different directions that, that um, 
Macbeth could be addressing. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a great ambiguous line that potentially hints at Macbeth's uh, family's deep fear of, of not continuing their line. Um, his, his ability to wipe out other people's families stemming from the fact that he doesn't have one. Uh, but anyway, Macduff steals himself for revenge uh, to avenge himself uh, for his family and for his country. Um, act 5, scene 1, we're in the final act of the play. Uh, here we see the toll that uh, guilt. Mm, this is cutting out my all right, fine. It says, Act 5, Scene 1, Lady Macduff's Madness. There, now you know what the whole thing says. Um, uh, we can see the, the toll that the guilt is having on Lady Macbeth. She and her husband haven't uh, interacted since the banquet that we that we saw, that you know, not that we've seen anyway. Um, and they're, they're each slipping further and further away from each other. Uh, hers is manifesting in sleepwalking, uh, you know, more of that not being able to sleep. Uh, and the doctor decides that she needs spiritual guidance rather than medical aid. Uh, he says, unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Uh, that, that line right there could you know, certainly sum up the whole play, right? Uh, infected minds to their death pillows will discharge their secrets. Um, or that idea, again, of, of sleeplessness. Uh, all of the problems Macbeth was having uh, have caught up to Lady Macbeth here, too. And uh, she, she is wringing her hands, trying to wash her hands of the blood that she thinks is still on them. Uh, out, damn spot, out, I say. And it, it certainly recalls earlier when she told Macbeth, a little water cleans us of this deed. Uh, certainly doesn't seem to feel true anymore to uh, Lady M. So at this point, the action you know, starts to speed up. Things start to catch up um, very, very quickly. Things, things, are, things are happening. Things are moving. Um, we see briefly in 5-2 that another Scottish Scottish force marches uh, towards Burnham Woods to join Macduff and his army. Uh, in 5-3, uh, reports of this are brought to Macbeth, uh, and he assuages his own doubts by thinking about the apparitions and saying, no man born of woman can harm Macbeth, and that Burnham Woods itself would have to uh, march towards my castle to defeat me. Um, but, but he's also anxious about, about uh, Lady Macbeth's condition. He tells the doctor, uh, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon her heart. Uh, and the doctor's like, um, therein the patient must minister uh, to himself, which is fantastic, right? Because the doctor did not say herself, the doctor said himself, indicating that he's addressing Macbeth, you know, um, who might be, I mean, certainly Lady Macbeth has all of her own troubles and doubts and guilt and everything, but M Macbeth... Um, might be projecting his own fears onto his wife is what the doctor is kind of hinting at. Uh, um, you know, um, but perhaps, perhaps at the same time, Macbeth thinks that he's cured himself and he's doing just fine. He's got no problems. Um, uh, you know, but the doctor here kind of makes him rethink that. That's, that's another way, way to read it. Um, he says, I'll give you anything to cure her. And the doctor says to himself, uh, I'm leaving. Uh, He's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, your highness. But then, you know, to himself, I am leaving. Not for all the, mo all the money in the world would I stay here. Um, which, you know, just another little hint at, at, at Macbeth's tyrannical rule and, and how terrified his people are and, and not even money can make them, make them stay. Uh, Act 5, scene 4 shows us uh, Macduff riding forth. You know, the scenes are short here. The action is building. We see Macduff. Mac Macduff. Um, Macduff instructs his two troops to cut branches down from, from the woods to march with them to hide their numbers uh, from Macbeth. Um, and then Act 5, uh, Scene 5, is where we see, uh, you know, the action sped up, and now and now the wheels are coming off uh, of Macbeth's um, murder train. Let's, let's call it Macbeth's murder train. Um, he's, he's gearing up for battle. He's feeling good about his odds. He's in his element. Uh, you know, from the first time we saw him, we know he was a warrior. So he's, he's riding tall. He's feeling good. He's got all these predictions on his side. And then, and then you hear this cry off stage. And the whole place shifts, you know. And Macbeth asks what the noise is. Um, and it says he's almost forgotten the taste of fears. Think, you know, that cry, thinking about that, that sound of, 
of fright. Um, but then they tell him uh, that the queen has died. And, uh, and there's one of Shakespeare's most famous soliloquies. Uh, well, I guess technically not a soliloquy, um, because others are on stage. So monologue, famous monologue. Uh, and it's obviously, of course, up to the actor and how you read it. But tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour about the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Um, one interesting thing to note here is the description that um, that he uses of, of the clock here, you know, the idea of the last syllable of recorded time. I remember I told you in the sonnet sequence that they didn't have minute hands at this point. And uh, now that Macbeth has come out, the, the actually the minute hand has just very recently been created in the early 1600s. Um, so instead of just just having your hour hand that that very slowly changed between the hours and then the church clocks that would that would chime to let you know what time it was, you know what hour it was, and that sort of thing. Now there's a minute hand, and so there's the idea of of instead of minutes being general vague concepts, they're they're measurable things. Um, and, and the idea of time being being measured out very specifically in, in these these little increments, and so this is a, a relatively new development in in the Western world. And he's Macbeth is using it here um, to to talk about about how time is just agonizingly, inchingly marching on, uh, despite uh, his wife's death, and how you know the, the pain of that and, and, the, and everything. So it's it's really you know it's a short. Um, it's a short monologue when, when your wife has died, not very specifically about her at all, but it's also very nihilistic, right? It's very existential, like, what's the point, what's the meaning, you know, um, behind things. Like, it's a moving, gut-wrenching rendition of how empty life is, how empty those minutes are without uh, the one you love by your side, you know. She's dead, life is meaningless, things just keep ticking forward. Um, or, or you could read it the opposite way, that, that you know, like who life just keeps on keeps on ticking it's it's worth nothing what does it matter what does anything matter um so yeah also I'm, again i'm sorry that the frame of this is cutting off the edge of my of my powerpoint here so i am um, i apologize that you can't read that perfectly but i know it's in your books uh or or your your sources that you're getting you're getting um the plays from, so I know that you can turn to it now if you if you so wanted to take notes or, or anything. Anyway, the pace of battle does not allow him uh, very much time to grieve, uh, because right on the heels of this revelation about his wife and, and his his tribute to that death, however you want to take it, a messenger arrives. Whoops! I stepped in my dog's tail. Um, a messenger arrives and uh, tells him. He hardly knows how to describe what he saw, except to say that it seemed as if Burnham Woods was marching to the castle. <laughs> and then, of course, at this point, Macbeth freaks out. Can't trust them witches. Uh, so, Act 5, Scene 8, um, he, he says, Why should I play the Roman fool and die on my own sword? Uh, which is uh, a kind of a reference to a different play that Shakespeare wrote, and uh, Antony and Cleopatra, Antony, who killed himself on his own sword, um, killed himself. Um, while I see lives, uh, the gashes do better. Up while yeah, uh, the gashes do better upon them, you know. So I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to, um, you know, just just turn in. Um, as long as I live, I'd rather give gashes to other people. And so he's going to fight until the end. Uh, even though he's he's lost his army in his castle, um, a lot of his troops are turning from him and joining the other side. Um, so he says, but he says he's not afraid. Um, for as he keeps saying, no no man or woman born uh, can can defeat me. Um, and then you know Macduff finally encounters him, and and they've been chasing around each other on the stage. And it makes for an even more dramatic moment when they're both finally uh, on stage together, face to face, for the first time. 
you know, in the, in the play since since um, the discovery of of the dead king, um, and 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 the coronation. You know, he's back. Uh, Macduff is back, and uh, and and Macduff is afraid to fight him because he's killed his entire family. Um, but but then you know Macbeth, Macbeth brags about uh, his charmed existence. You know, saying. Uh, you're, I'm, unde uh, yeah. I'm unable to be defeated by anybody born of a woman. To which Macduff is like, oh really? Uh, that's, I'm glad you said that, that's interesting. Uh, because I was not technically born, I was um, from my mother untimely ripped. Uh, A.K.A. he was he was taken by a cesarean section, by C-section. Um, which is uh, a bit of a technicality, isn't it? Um, but you know, that's that's equivocation, and that's what the witches thrive on. Uh, and so now Macbeth is afraid to fight. He's like, oh, come on. Seriously? Uh, so so Macduff tells him, okay, well, if you're not going to fight me, then I'm going to capture you instead, and I'm going to display you on a pole with a sign that says, here you may see a tyrant. Uh, so Macbeth fights, and, uh, and Macbeth is slain. And, and Macduff drags his body off stage. Um, and then comes back out with, with Macbeth's head uh, and gives it to Malcolm, who is now king. Um, and then, you know, we presume that uh, Malcolm's child will then marry the escaped uh, Fleance, and Banquo's sons will reign in a long line leading right on down to King James, uh, who watched this play to much delight, I assume. Um, I also want to point out briefly that, uh, you know, bringing out the severed head, severed heads were probably something that the Elizabethan audience was pretty familiar with, you know. On London Bridge, traitors' heads, Catholic heads hung there on the regular. Uh, people who were accused of of being traitors and, and of heresy and different things were drawn and quartered. It was, it was a very gruesome time, and while, you know, public executions weren't necessarily um, forms of entertainment, they were definitely highly attended and, and public and, and highly watched and everything, so... So this, this display of, of Macbeth's head is just one of many uh, in Shakespeare's plays, but it's certainly a, a memorable one. Um, and uh, and it, it's definitely interesting nowadays how you make it, how you make it lifelike on stage. I heard, I heard uh, one uh, actor talking about how they had to make sure that when, when it was you know, thrust forward at, at Malcolm's feet that it didn't, it didn't bounce too much. They had to make it realistic, you know. Um, so that it would it would seem like a real head. Uh, so how did you know how did Shakespeare's uh, you know, theater troupe do this? How how was it presented on stage? Because it's um, severed heads were something that that appear in quite a number of of his plays. Uh, so just just something to note, something to know. Um, this this uh, very very bloody ending brings us to the end of um, of Macbeth. Uh, quite quickly. Wow, I, I sure I sure spoke fast in this one. Um, so I guess if you have any extra questions or any thoughts, you know where to find me, and uh, and I'll see you next week for Hamlet. I think we'll see.